All right, let's open up our Bibles to 1 John. 1 John chapter 2 is where we are going to be today. And man, aren't you glad we're not under the tent on a day like today that we have this sanctuary and air conditioning? Holy cow. That would have been a little rough. I mean, it's like a whole different climate walking up those, that, that ramp getting here. Uh, Pastor Mike, he's over in Illinois. He's visiting Woodlawn Chapel. It was a church that we planted in 2020. So I'm sure he's enjoying his time over there with Pastor Brock and his family. Their church is doing fantastic. Uh, it's good to see what God is doing over there. So first John, last time I was up here on a Sunday, uh, we did go through first John chapter two, the first eight verses. And I thought we would enjoy diving back into this amazing letter. We've kind of been dog paddling through this letter uh, behind Ezekiel. Um, and so we're just going to dive into that instead of, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure you were anticipating and just on edge to hear Babylon, the sword of God in Ezekiel 21. But instead, we get Jesus in the New Testament and the glory revealed in the New Testament. So I'll leave that to Mike. But we're back in chapter two of this lovely letter written by the disciple whom Jesus loved, John. And John wrote to defend and to define the nature of Jesus Christ against heretical teachings that were infiltrating into the early church. And John, he powerfully set forth Jesus Christ as the true son of God, both undiminished deity and unprotected humanity. Jesus was both 100% man and 100% God at the same time. John also presents revolutionary implications of that truth for our relationship with God and for other people. It is also important to understand who John is writing to. He's not writing to unbelievers. These are uh, people that have been walking with Jesus. They're growing with Jesus. These are believers in Christ. They're, they're Christians. They're church attending Christians. And so John writes to encourage these believers to continue their walk and to continue their life of faith in Jesus, but not only to continue, but also to mature, to grow. And one more thing before we dive into the text, words, words. I mean, a lot of the times words can get overused and they can lose their value or lose their meaning or they just get uh, oversaid. Um, for example, swag. When I was in middle school and high school and college, like swag was just used so many times it just doesn't even, you know, compute like you guys are staring at me like I just said something wrong. Um, they're like, you get it, right? Swag, um, holla, I guess that was a thing, like the early 90s or something. Um, tomfoolery, that was one. Nobody says that anymore, or maybe. And then let's do one more. Let's do um, the cat's pajamas. Yeah, that's one too. You know, it just doesn't get said anymore. It's, it's lost its value. And unfortunately for the word love, or sometimes people will text it L-U-V, which I guess it's too much time to spell it right and to add one more letter, we're just going to shorten it and misspell it because I don't know. But love is losing its value. It's being used as an excuse to cover a multitude of sins. The Bible does say that love covers a multitude of sins, but what do you mean by love? How do you define love? Our culture will say that love is love, which is, it's not. John in this letter in chapter four will say that God is love. And it's really difficult, kind of ironic how a man can use the same word to express his love for his wife as he uses the same word to tell how he feels about food. I mean, it's pretty funny. You ask a man how he feels about his wife and hopefully he says that I love her, she's my everything, you know, all the right things. But then if you ask a man, how do you feel about a tomahawk steak, medium rare ribeye cooked over open coals with a baked potato, you know, and a tall glass of Coke, then you might have to ask yourself how much time you got because that could turn into a podcast episode about food. <laughs> and in America, we love everything. We attach love to everything. And it just seems to lose its value quickly. And when words that are used that carelessly, they really mean little or nothing at all. And as John, he describes the Christian life here, he uses three words repeatedly throughout this letter. Life, 
love, and light. And in fact, John uses the word love or some form of that word some 50 times in this short letter, which is why he is referred to as the apostle of love. And he explains that love, life, and light are intertwined, that they belong together. And through reading this letter, you will see that love, life, and light cannot be separated. They all coexist. And we will find this immediately in the text this morning in verse 9 is where we'll pick back up. And John says that he who is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So you can see immediately that the passage continues this illustration of light and darkness. Johnny makes a contrast between darkness, between light, between love, between hate. This is very black and white. Light, darkness, love, hate. There is no middle ground in what he's talking about right here. But again, if a Christian says, I walk in the light. I love God. I believe there's a God out there. I abide in Jesus. Yes, I know the Lord. If they say that with their lips, but at the same time they hate their brother, they are not walking in the light. And if a Christian walks in the light, he is to have fellowship with God, but he will also be in fellowship with others in God's family because to walk in the light, again, is to walk in love. It is to love your brother, your sister. It is not to hate them. And of course, it's easy to stay, be up here and say, you know, love each other. Christian love is easy to talk about, but to practice that is where it gets tough. You know, it's not just mere talk as we just read in verse nine. And for a Christian to say, or probably even to sing during worship that he or she loves the brethren, that they love the church while they actually hate another believer is for him to lie. So in other words, this is pretty sobering truth. It is impossible to be in fellowship with the Father and to be out of fellowship with another Christian at the same time. This is the one reason why God established the local church, the fellowship of believers. You can't just be a Christian alone. You can't be a Christian and have hate in your heart. It does not mix. A person cannot live a complete and developing Christian life unless that person is in fellowship with God's people. That's what John is trying to get out here with mature believers, to be in church, to be in fellowship with believers. So ask yourself, how many times uh, do you come here? Maybe just on Sundays, so that's just an hour out of your week to be in fellowship with God's people. A couple Sundays out of the month, then you're at two hours a week with God's people. And then you have like your one-time attenders, your Easter and Christmas service, so that's like two hours out of the year that you spend with God's people. And what about events? We have events here from time to time, and we have our biggest event that we've ever planned for. This Saturday, Jesus in July, there's flyers in your seats there. So this is a great opportunity to hang out with fellow believers and to bring friends along as well. And I know life happens. I, I get it. Like, you can't uh, control some circumstances, your job, vacations, work schedules, kids, and really, regardless, however many times you are here, we just care that you're here, but you, you can see it. The more that people hang out here, the deeper and more further along they are in their walk. But again, in the context that we're reading here, John is encouraging believers to continue in their life of faith in Jesus in accordance with the gospel that they have been taught, which includes fellowship with the church. And as a Christian, is your life really in accordance to the gospel? The gospel. Is your life in accordance to a life-altering, a world-changing truth? Is your life in accordance with that, or is it with something else? And so Jesus, he actually deals with this matter of forgiveness and fellowshipping with the believers. In Matthew 5, 23, you don't have to turn there, I'll read it for you. Matthew 5, 23, Jesus says this, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, so when you come to church and worship, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, your brother has something against you, so you're at fault, 
Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. So the gift on the altar was useless. It was valueless as long as the worshiper had a dispute to settle with his brother. And in the case in Matthew 5, 23, Jesus did not say that the worshiper had something to settle against his brother, but that the brother had something against the worshiper. So you did something to offend somebody else is what Jesus is saying. You should be the one to go and make reconciliation with them. Don't wait. And when somebody wrongs you, don't wait for them to come and say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. No, you go and make that decision first. This is the mature walk is to ask for forgiveness first and to go and make reconciliation first. So if we've offended somebody, go and ask for forgiveness. And the Christian practice is that you should forgive the other brother immediately. I mean, think how much Jesus has forgiven you. Surely we can be more forgiving with that understanding. And Jesus considers it far more important to be reconciled to a brother or a sister than to perform a religious duty. Jesus says we first must be reconciled to your brother. And we can't think that our service towards the Lord justifies bad relationships with others. I love what Paul said in Romans 12, 18. If possible... Uh, as much depends on you, live peaceably with all men. And so that happens when a believer, uh, when he does not love the brethren as we have seen, he lives in darkness, though he probably thinks he's living in the light. Right? He thinks he sees, but he's actually blinded by the darkness of hatred. The person could be reading their Bible faithfully. They could be in prayer fervently. But if he has hatred in his heart, then he's living a lie. Christians cannot have hate in their heart. And so let me ask you this. Has there been somebody or is there anybody in your life that you'd say right now, I hate, <laughs> I hate that person. I hate this guy. I hate this girl. Whatever it may be. Now don't raise your hand for that, but you know, I think we've all felt that sentiment before. We're human. It's our sinful nature. And you might say, well, you don't know what they did to me. You don't, you don't know how they took advantage of me, how they hurt me emotionally and physically, it, whatever the case may be. And I may not know, and more than likely, I have no idea, but I know somebody who does. Jesus. Just think about that. It's an obvious answer, but Jesus was beaten beyond the recognition of a man. And for what? He healed people. He loved others when they felt like they were not lovable. He was claiming the truth for eternal life. He was proclaiming the gospel. And for that, he was spit upon. His back was lacerated open. He was nailed to a cross. And yet, what did he say while he was, his hands were being nailed to a cross? Father, forgive them. I mean, when's the last time you were in a situation where somebody was nailing you down to a cross and you said, Father, forgive them? I don't think we've ever been in that situation. But Jesus, in this, I, I can't even fathom what that would have been like, but his first reaction was to plead for forgiveness for these people. And when you forgive them, when you forgive this person in your life, maybe there's somebody who needs to do that, I don't know. But... It doesn't mean you have to be best friends and, you know, go to Cold Jack on the weekdays and, you know, get a cup of coffee, as nice as that may be. You don't have to go fishing with them on the lake. And, uh, you know, you don't have to go buy a tandem bike and go ride around St. Joe with them. Now, you can go do those things. I mean, feel free. I don't want to see pictures of, you know, uh, you guys on a tandem bike, but, you know, go do your thing. But you can love them by forgiving them. And when you choose to forgive, you are free because when you hold on to that unforgiveness, it develops this bitter root inside of you and then you're bound, you're chained. When in Christ, we are free. 
And if we practice Christian love, three results will be evident. First of all, we will be living in the light. You'll be living in fellowship with God and your Christian brothers and sisters. And second, we won't stumble or become stumbling blocks to others. And third, we grow spiritually and progress towards the image of Christ. But love does not live alone. Love produces joy. And hatred, it makes a man miserable. I mean, you ever notice that person who's just always cranky, mean, irritated? There's just hatred in their heart, but love always brings joy. And there are other exciting truths in the rest of this letter and in the rest of 1 John. This letter is astounding. But if we fail to obey in this matter of love, the rest of this letter is really just darkness to us and it's not going to do you any good if you can't have this simple truth in your life. I mean, it's interesting because Jesus said your love for one another will prove what? Your love for one another will prove that you are my disciples. That's how people know Jesus. That's how people get to know the Lord is by how we love each other. It's not the amount of biblical knowledge you think you have. It's not about the good deed you do to boost your ego or whatever that might be. It's not that you have the end times mapped out on a little pegboard with different colored wires and uh, you have a bunker that's ready to go when things go to, uh, you know, in a, in a handbasket or whatever. That's not it. It's how we love one another is how people will experience and get to know Jesus. That's how the world gets to know what salvation is, is by the way, we love one another because of the gospel. And perhaps the best thing you need to do is to search your own heart. What did David ask the Lord in Psalm 139? Search me, O Lord, and know my heart. And see if there's anything against a brother, against a sister, or against anything uh, that has either brought you harm or, or has had a strife in your life because a life that is real is an honest life. And this life of forgiveness is of doing, not just merely saying. Now, if you're with us in our Wednesday night study, we we're going through Ephesians. Ephesians teaches us as new Christians, we are to sit in the finished work of Christ. We're not to do anything. We're to rest, right? You're to be. We're human beings. But John is calling us to do, which Ephesians also moves on to. You got to walk. So once you've sat under the teaching, once you've uh, been uh, found your rest in the Lord, then you start to walk and you start to do. And so this action, this action of love, it's an act of life, which means forgiveness. It means kindness and long suffering. But you know what it also means? A life of peace, joy, and victory. We're more than conquerors. And if we say that we walk in the light, then it will be manifested by the way that we love. Now, it's easier to love certain people than others. Who, who grew up with a sibling? I'm pretty sure you can attest to that rather quickly, right? And it's easy to respond to uh, love somebody when they love you back. That's easy. Jesus said even the Pharisees and, and you know the hypocrites, they can do that. But when rubber meets the road, it's, it's hard to love somebody when they despise you or they hate you for an unnecessary reason. That's hard. But the good news is that God can enable you to love that person by the empowering of his Holy Spirit, which is a byproduct of the fruit of the Spirit, love. So hopefully you can see how important this love life is in the life of a Christian. It's a life that's real. It's a life that we will have uh, plenty of practice and opportunities to show love to one another. So we understand love inside and out, right? Yeah, we don't need to cover it again. I got one laugh. I think we're good. All right, let's move on. Verse 12. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the father. I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. So obviously you can see that there are three stages or three groups that John mentions. And in writing to these three groups, we see three stages in which a person is in their walk with the Lord. This isn't John making a shout out to children's church, then the youth group and so on. John is addressing his readers according to their measure of spiritual maturity. 
And when a person first comes to Christ for salvation, the Bible tells us that they're like a brand new baby. That as a baby in the Lord, they are to desire the pure milk of the word so that they can grow. You sit and rest in Jesus. And when a person first gets saved, their knowledge of the Lord is very limited. As we can see, verse 12 tells us what they know. You just know your sins are forgiven. You know who your father is. And, you know, you never want to forget that. That's very important to understand. But that's a basic knowledge you have when you get saved. All I know is I've accepted Jesus. My sins are forgiven. My father's in heaven and he loves me. And I'm going to be in heaven with him someday. Never forget that. But don't just stop there. Because as you grow in your walk with the Lord, you begin to mature as a child matures. You grow, you become a young person in the Lord, a young man or a young woman. And when he writes to these young men, he says here, I write to you because you have overcome the wicked one and you are strong because the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. So suddenly you move from being this child of just knowing who your father is. I know my sins are forgiven, but now you come to this place where you realize you're in a spiritual battle and spiritual warfare, that there's a battle going on all around me. There's a devil, there's an adversary. He hates me and he wants to destroy me. And so you realize you're engaged in this conflict and that you need to put on the spiritual armor that you might be able to fight off the attacks of the enemy. So you've progressed from being a brand new baby, understanding just a little bit more to what it's like to walk with Jesus. You grow. You learn that it's a fight. I mean, having kids and walking with the Lord is a fight. Uh, trust me, I was the one causing the fights and the issues and everything that went on. There are going to be trials. There are going to be temptations. There is a battle, but you are able to overcome the wicked one by taking heed to the word of God. This is why we encourage you to read through the Bible on your own. Uh, and there might be some young women and men in the faith, spiritually, Physical age doesn't matter for spiritual maturity. Please understand that as well. Battling temptation. You might be battling against the forces of darkness. And we all are. And so how do you overcome that? And it says here by the word of God. Jesus, our prime example, he withstood the temptations of the devil because he knew the word of God. And each time he was confronted three times, he said, it is written. And he overcame and so the same principle will apply if we know the word of God, if we sharpen the sword of the spirit in our lives. So get out your word sword, right? Get it out and use it. Defend yourself with the word of God. But he writes to that third group, and I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. And he says that twice uh, because men need things said to them twice. They don't hear the first time. Again, men need things said to them twice because they don't hear the first time. Again, all this, all this is spiritual maturity. You've been walking with the Lord. You got saved. You've been walking with the Lord. You still know the Lord and you're still walking with the Lord. And these are fathers in the faith. These guys have grown in their walk with the Lord. And the encouragement here is to finish well. So you start out as a brand new child. Like a little child, then you grow up to the stage of understanding. There's this spiritual conflict and you continue to grow. You realize you're solid in your faith and that you're not going anywhere. You know the Lord is going to carry you and to see you through that. He's faithful to do so. And the Bible talks about these three groups. And really, no matter what place you're in, in your growth and walk with the Lord, uh, you want to keep on growing. I like what Jason said when he was teaching. You never retire from the Christian life. You don't want to be a baby forever. That'd be weird. And the Bible talks about some Christians. For example, Paul, if you remember, he writes that some of you by this time ought to be teachers, but you need to learn the first principles all over again because you've never gone beyond this. Let's say you've been a Christian for 10 15, 20 years, and you haven't gotten deeper than the fact that your sins are forgiven and that you're going to heaven. You know, some people might think, well, can I just get my uh, get out of hell free card and, you know, my fire insurance? And sure, like, yes, but that's a wasted life. It's a saved life, but it's a wasted life. You know, God wants to take you deeper. He wants to show you more things. He wants to develop you and to grow you spiritually. I mean, think of it this way. My little nep nephew, Micah, little Micah Moo, I think he's like seven months old. 
It's really awesome to see little Micah Moo in diapers, you know, learning how to talk, how to, how to speak, and he's mumbling different things, and he's throwing up all over the place, and everybody's like, oh, he's so little cute, Micah. And when Micah, go, and when Micah Moo goes poo, everybody kind of goes like, oh, his face is so red and crinkly, is, and, you know. But when Micah turns my age, and if he's still wearing diapers saying goo goo gaga, and he's, you know, doing one of these numbers, that's not very cute anymore. It's not very wonderful for a 26 year old man to still be a baby. And it's not good for your walk with Jesus to remain a spiritual baby, to remain a spiritual young man. Continue to grow. Because there's a reason. Somebody may ask, well, why do I need to grow spiritually? Well, spiritual immaturity leads to spiritual lethargy. And this can actually lead to spiritual apathy. And the best way to combat this is to worship. Hebrews makes that clear. To combat this apathy and not growing in the Lord is to worship. And from the warnings written in Hebrews, this is like worst case scenario, it can lead to apostasy, a denial of Jesus when you don't grow in your spiritual walk. And so John writes to these three groups. He's encouraging them. He's exhorting them, grow in your relationship with Jesus. Go deeper. Forgive people. Be here on Sundays and Wednesdays and when we have a Jesus in July event and, and 4.30 a.m. studies, be here. Grow in the Lord. And then John, he closes out or will close out today with 15, 16, and 17. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, by the way, this is the love that God hates the love of the world, he hates it. The love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. And so don't love the world. The church of Jesus Christ, as we all know, we're called in the world, but not to be of the world. Jesus said to his disciples, you, you were of this world. The world would love you for the world loves its own. But you and I, as Christians, we're not of this world. We're an ambassador to the world. And as a Christian uh, in this world, I'm not called to isolate myself. I'm called to infiltrate, to infiltrate the kingdom of darkness with the kingdom of light. But it appears from this context that the world was beginning to have an effect upon the early church. And what happens is when compromise sets in is that the effectiveness of the witness uh, of that church can be hindered greatly. And so John, he's writing again. He is exhorting them to do not, do not love the world. Uh, I guess parents, when you tell your kids, do not, you expect that to be a command and that they obey. It's not suggestive when you get to the point of, of do not. And I think John is about as serious as you can get with this. Do not love the world because God hates that. Why would you love the thing that God hates? Now, it's important for us to understand what John is not saying. He's not saying that you can't love a beautiful sunset or a day out in the lake or in the river or whatever it might be or Mexican food because I love all those things. And I'm sure you do too. Again, we love it, right? But what he is talking about here is the world system. All that governs the world. The one who is behind the world system, if you didn't know, the prince of the power of the air, the ruler of this world, the king of darkness, the devil. And so I'm not enamored or in love with the things of this world because I want to be weaned from the things of this world so that I can have more of a desire for the things of God. Because doing the will of God is a joy for those living in the love of God. If you love me, Jesus said, keep my commandments. 
But when a believer loses his enjoyment of the Father's love, he finds it hard to obey the Father's will. And when you put these factors together, you have a practical definition of worldliness, which is anything in a Christian's life that causes him to lose enjoyment of the Father's love or his desire to do the Father's will is worldly and must be avoided. And so when you respond to the Father's love, hopefully that develops into a personal devotional life with him. In doing the Father's will, your daily conduct, how you carry yourself, can be a test of worldliness. Does that make sense? How much time you spend with the Lord, how your life plays out, can really tell how much worldliness is in or out of you. And so if that's spent with the Lord and, and spent with fellowshipping, the world and that has been in you for so long can be stripped away, can be pulled away, and it is a hard process. It is. It can hurt, but it's worth it. it it's, it's, it's for the eternal rewards as we will get to. But the things of the world, they're attractive. They're alluring. You know, they come in the form of the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. And, you know, at some point, you know, John probably could have added uh, the season of summer. You know, when summer hits, uh, a lot of things go on. We get busy. Kids' sports, vacation, camping, all that stuff gets in the way. And some of those are, are good things. John says you can enjoy those things, but when that becomes like your idol, like what you worship, and if that takes over your time in church, then that's the problem. But these three things specifically mentioned here are things that mankind has been battling since the beginning. You remember Genesis, Eve and Satan were having a conversation, which is not good. Never have a conversation with Satan. Talk to Jesus about Satan and he'll take care of it. So don't do that. But she gets in this conversation. God says, don't eat of the tree, right? He told that to Adam. Adam was supposed to tell that to Eve. So she probably knew she said something that was somewhat resemblant of what God said, but she didn't know everything. So Satan deceives her. He tempts her with the lust of the flesh. Look at this fruit. Oh boy, I bet it's pretty tasty. So now she's locked in. But look at it, lust of the eyes. And then Satan also says that if you eat this, you can be like God, and she fell for it. And as a result, Adam also fell for it. And so here we are. And the point is we're still battling it, the same exact thing. This is what we are fighting, and so what are we to do? And we're not to love the things of this world because if I love the world in that sense, and it shows that the love of the Father is not in me. If I'm just caught up in the world system and just enamored with the rest of the world in the direction that it's going, something is wrong. And the Bible tells us that the love of God is not being manifested in you. That's what John is saying. And if you're still in awe and just enamored with the world system and you have this great affection and habitual action that follows that, John says the love of God is not dwelling in you. That the love of God is not a ruling principle in your life. And Jesus says in Matthew 6, 24, nobody, no one, and do you know what that word means in the Greek? Nobody or no one can serve two masters because you're going to have a divided heart. You're either going to love the one and hate the other or despise this one and love this one. You can't serve God and man and you can't serve God in the world. And at some point, you've got to make a conscious decision. I'm either going to walk with Jesus or I'm going to walk with this world system with everybody else. You can't be neutral. There's no neutrality in this. You can't just sit back and saying, I'm saved, I'm fine, I'm good. I go to church here and there, I'm going to put the sucker in cruise control. This is a black and white decision. Either you follow Jesus and you walk with Jesus or you don't. But if you try and keep a foothold here and a foothold there, like some sort of balancing act, Jesus says that's impossible, yet so many people try. They're not all in with Christ but they don't want to be all out either. They're not all in with the world, but they don't want to be all out either. Why? It's because the love of the world is still drawing them away. And often, if we're not careful, the spirit of this age, the ruler of this world, is looking to pivot certain things in your life, maybe to adjust so that you, know, you can get a reputation, and then you'll use that to give God glory, which is backwards. 
and man gets fooled by reputation and recognition. That's what they go by, how many followers you have. I, I hope to maintain a good reputation with this group. I hope they know my last name. People knew my dad, my grandfather, his great-grandfather. What's your PhD? People are so worried about this, and heaven doesn't see any of that. God sees people that want nothing to do with a reputation. He's looking, as Paul would call himself, for bond servants to grab a hold of and to walk humbly with the Lord till death. God sees everybody, but he doesn't see you because of what you've accomplished, uh, what you've made yourself to be. He sees you because he created you. He sees you because he loves you. He sees you because he actually has something for your life that is for eternity. He sees that in you because he created you. Not because what you've done. And again, just like anybody else, I have to fight this. I have to fight the world system. I have to battle the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, literally till the day I die. And this love for the world, it manifests itself in, in various ways. You can become desensitized to sin and you get caught up with possessions and staying current and keeping up with whoever becomes the standard. But when you love Jesus, it manifests itself in various ways. And there is a desire to abide in Christ, to walk in the light, to walk in forgiveness, to desire closely, uh, to live closely to the Lord, to love God's people, to love the lost. And these three things will constantly be a battle, but John tells us that the end of all things, in verse 17, the end of all things is near. He is very clearly stating that the world is passing away. And I really hope you know this. This is one of my favorite things to really have stirring in my mind, that this isn't it. I hope you realize that there is a new heavens and a new earth that is about to uh, to be here, you know, when Jesus returns and, and we get to be with him, like, guys, you're working towards an eternal city that we get to live in. An eternal city that we get to live in with new bodies. And I hope the bass fishing is going to be unreal when we get there. Because you know why? The Dead Sea is going to have life in it. And I'm going to bring my bait caster if I can have one, you know. But if I can't, that's fine. Because I get to go to a new creation with Jesus and walk in eternity with him. And I love that truth, that th this world is not it. This 70 to 80 years that we get on earth is such a minuscule piece of time because eternity is what we are shooting for. One day, all that is will no longer be. That's what the Bible says. That's in my Bible, right? You know, there will be a new heavens, a new earth. This world system is passing away and it, one day it'll come to an end. And this vain, futile show, this sin parade that Satan is conducting is going to stop one day. And on the other hand, the contrast is that those who do the will of God, they endure forever, they abide forever. Whoever does the will of God abides forever. That's a strong contrast to the passing world because some things are forever it is much wiser to invest our lives into that which cannot be lost, doing the will of God. You know, you're in regular contact with three eternal things, the Holy Spirit of God, the people around you, and the eternal words recorded in the book you hold. And so your time, your attention, and your expenses should be put into things because that pays eternal rewards. That's the promise. If you do the will of God, you abide forever. And so we'll conclude this morning uh, think, thinking about these things. And John writes three times in the first 17 verses of chapter 2, if we say we know him, if we say we abide in Jesus, if we say we walk in the light, then what will follow is that we will live according to his word. We will love our brothers, our sisters. We will forgive them no matter what they've done. And we will walk as he walked, not just saying it with our lips, but by demonstrating it with our lives. And God will help us to be what and who we are in light of Jesus and to live and to do the will of God, which is awesome because the Bible says that it is God who puts it in us to will and to do for his good pleasure. 
And I pray that that would be the case with us. Would you guys pray with me? So Father, just thank you so much for the truths found in 1 John. Lord, I thank you so much that you have revealed in your word how important forgiveness is and, and uh, how we need to grow in spiritual maturity. Lord, help us to do that by the power of your spirit. Lord, thank you for your grace that abounds and your mercy that uh, is new every morning. So Lord, as we take in these truths, may we apply it. May we just not sit there this morning and, and leave it there, but take it with us today, tomorrow, and into next week and whenever you call us home. So thank you, Lord, for loving us first. In Jesus' name, amen.